Black Before Columbus came, the African discovery of America. Christopher Columbus did not discover America. Exactly. I mean, never mind the question of like, uh, like how you can discover a place where the inhabitants are watching you arrive from the shore. Uh, evidence has surfaced and continually grown to indicate that many of these pre-Columbian explorers might have come from Africa. So the first scientist to promote this possibility was Leo Wiener. Born in Russia, Wiener immigrated uh, to the United States in the late 19th century on his way to British Honduras, uh, where he planned to open a vegetarian commune. Well, uh, when that turned out not to be the dream job he expected, uh, he uh, moved back to the United States and he became a professor at Harvard University, as one does. And, uh, but in his time in Mesoamerica, he started noticing things. There are lots of things that led him to encounter certain discoveries that uh, made him consider that possibly uh, if the origins of American civilization might actually be in Africa. So he observed so many linguistic and botanical and other similarities that between 1920 and 1922, he published an extensive three-volume piece uh, called Africa and the Discovery of America. Now, unfortunately, this is the 1920s, so as yet, no serious archaeological evidence had been done to, or work had been done to support his botanical theories, because everyone knows over raiding tombs in, uh, in Egypt and things like that. Nod to Howard Carter. So, he didn't have a whole lot of other stuff than, uh, than the names to support him. However, he knew that other clues must exist. For example, he pointed out that Columbus himself was aware that African mariners had preceded him. In his diary of his second voyage, uh, Columbus tells of how the natives of Hispaniola actually had given him gold-tipped metal spearheads that they said were brought by black-skinned people who had come in large boats from the south and southeast. Hmm. Coincidence? I think not. No. So uh, what's interesting about that, so upon returning to Spain, is that he actually took the spearheads and he, uh, he sent them away and they had them uh, assayed. And it turned out to be that they, uh, uh, the, these spearheads were covered in this metal, that, uh, this alloy that the inhabitants called guanin. And uh, <coughs> the metallurgists uh, actually found out that this was an alloy of 32 parts. It was like 18 of gold, 6 of silver, 8 of copper, which dun 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 matched the metal used in spearheads made in Western Africa for thousands of years as carried by medieval African warriors, including the Mali and the Moors. The West Africans even called this metal guanine, the same name used by the natives of Hispaniola. But nothing more was said about that. Conspiracy. Conspiracy. In 1493, Columbus stole all he could see. Yeah, so on his second voyage, which was 10 times larger than the first, uh, Columbus went on a frantic but unsuccessful island hopping trip to find gold and spices. He carried along several natives uh, from his newly discovered San Salvador, uh, which the inhabitants called uh, Guanahanvi. Uh, another island that the natives pointed out, which was really large, and uh, was called uh, Soameto. Soameto. Now, Columbus continued going around whimsically renaming every island he could find, but, uh, you know, Leo Wiener, being the, uh, being the curious person and the linguist that he was and the etymologist, he, he couldn't help noticing that the origin of these many place names and botanical names in Mesoamerica uh, actually sounded distinctly like other languages in Africa, particularly Bantu and even Arabic. Okay, so how do these plants and languages and other cultural elements get to the Americas? Well, you know, some believe years. Africans migrated out of Africa and then over the Bering Strait, then down into South America, and, uh, and things like that. Well, uh, another explanation exists, and so get ready. There you go. Let it out of your system. Awesome. Africans had ships. In fact, they had four kinds of... They had... Oh, unbelievable. They had, they had a shipload of vessels. And hey, so, in fact, they had four kinds of vessels. Uh, and Nubian pottery... This is an example of a Nubian pottery with a painting on it that shows a long-hold pottery. Art! Art! 
that, uh, that shows either a long-hold boat, boat or a papyrus raft or a, a, a hauled-out canoe. And then this other uh, painting beside it is from, uh, the first one was um, from 3000 BC. And this is a bird's eye view of an oared riverboat <coughs> in Chad. Uh, and it dates from 3500 BCE. Now, the Africans of Guinea also had dugout canoes hewn from these monumental trees on the coast there. In 1500, 1500, it's just a few years after Columbus's voyage, the Portuguese captain uh, Pacheco Pereira wrote, in this country can be found the largest canoes made of a single trunk. Some are so large that they hold 80 men. Now, the West Africans were known to lash two dugout canoes together, side by side, and no one questions the seaworthiness of a similar type of Polynesian catamarans. Now, Islamic historian Amir Hajib reported that voyages west from Mali were happening in the year 1311, just uh, 150 years before Columbus. Now, when he asked the Mali emperor, um, shown here, incidentally, holding a, holding a globe of the world made of solid gold, uh, asked him, well, tell me about this uh, rumor about Atlantic travel. And he said that his predecessor had commissioned an expedition with 200 ships filled with men and a similar number with gold and, uh, and water and enough provisions for two years. And he said, uh, uh, you know, come, go, go, and go out and find something. And if you uh, don't come back, so you find something or you run out of food. And uh, unfortunately, only one ship returned. Uh, and the captains told the emperor that uh, we sailed for a very long time and we'll, until we met what, what, what seemed like a river with a strong current flowing in the open sea. It was, I was the last ship and I turned where I was and did not enter the current. The others disappeared. I do not know what became of them. And it's, you can see it's very easy for, uh, for Africans from the south and the Angola region and the Angola regions to come up towards the equator and going west westwards or from the western coast of Africa north of the equator to go eastwards along that same current. I definitely had to do that. Now, at least a dozen explorers, including Constantine Ravenes, reported seeing blacks upon reaching the New World. In fact, in 1513, Spanish explorer Vasco Nunez de Balboa, uh, who you might know because people named a very popular dance after him, uh, the... Uh, uh, anyway, so when Balboa was there, he said he met members of a tribe of Ethiopians in Panama. And according to Balboa's log, these men came from a totally black village that was two days' journey away. And he figured that these blacks had come from Ethiopia uh, at a much earlier date. So there are also examples of physical evidence, including pre-Columbian African skeletons, which have been found throughout the Americas. Now, dating between 800 BCE and 300 CE, these murals are from the Temple of the Warriors at Chichen Itza. Now, they clearly feature, uh, the color version is easier to see, but they clearly feature three races. And uh, there are, it's depicting black and Indian allies and a battle against white invaders. Now, because of their long blonde hair, hair jewelry, the, a skin hold boat that we have here, uh, right there, and also the fact that they're fighting naked, which was common for warriors from Ireland, they believe that these are Celtic warriors. And because this mural shows that blacks are clearly fighting on the side of the Mayans, that they must have been integrated in society much longer before this, uh, this uh, painting was, was done in order to form that form of alliance. Now, there are numerous pre-Columbian figurines with striking similarities to ancient African artwork and they've been found in Central and South America. In Southeastern Mexico, there are 18 rock statues that, of heads up to 11 feet tall that are facing the ocean looking east. Now, archeologists call them the Olmec colossal heads after the people that carved them. And uh, they were produced for 50 to 200 years and date from at least 900 BCE when they were mysteriously buried for some reason. So it should, now think about it. It took enormous effort to quarry these, uh, the smallest one was six tons, so six to 50 ton blocks, to quarry them and carry them 75 miles away from the quarry and then carve them and then erect them. Uh, these people that they, that they modeled them after must have been important. Whoever they were, they must have been uh, important to be re remembered or obeyed or worshiped. Uh, well, Jose Megliar Serrano, the, uh, the archaeologist who first uncovered them, 
uh, he, said, he pointed out that facial features look amazingly like African blacks, and they all display distinctive headgear or protective helmets. Now, however, some people think that these are actually uh, the facial figures of overweight babies. Yeah, I think, I think they needed to wear helmets when they were babies, if they think that, so. Yeah. And then still others find it easier to believe that instead of Africans, those depicted are responsible for these sculptures, and as well as the Mesoamerican pyramids, uh, were not African Americans, but dun dun dun. So many people have never heard of this alternative of American discovery by the continent's nearest neighbors. It is indeed a worldwide conspiracy to undermine any and all contributions of the ancient African to civilization and humanity. Africa is both the cradle of civilization and the wealthiest continent in precious metals and knowledge. Undermining the value of African empires, kingdoms, civilizations, and their wealth makes it easier to justify stealing their wealth, artifacts, and knowledge to build up other nations around the world. Thus, today, many descendants of these great civilizations have no record of their history and inherent wealth that now resides covered up in Europe. This great injustice is not being corrected today. For those that want to help the impoverished African should consider a movement to return its wealth and knowledge. Change the history books and give credit where it's rightfully due.